join the Zoom link. Sorry, the Zoom link. Um, also, the question um, for the, the question to feed in feed loop is to the right of the session and it's session specific. So just click on there or enter in the Q&A on the Zoom link. So with that, um, we may have um, put a damper on Alex's passion in the last session, but um, this is something that um, she's very passionate about. And you, you can read more on Alex in her bio, which is on uh, Feedloop. And, um, and this is a session on how to speak to your uh, your what is it? Your um, clinician, right? Or your health uh, that, professional? That yeah. is the official title. Yeah. It's sort of okay. diverged a little, but yes, officially. Okay. Is yeah, because <laughs> I, I I think that's uh, something that we all struggle with, and um, I, I think we're going to learn a lot from this this afternoon. So take it away, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, and just to warn you, my, my beagle mix, Safi, has woken up from her nap, so she may be chiming in soon. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Alex. Um, if you were at the, um, the panel discussion about an hour ago, um, I'm one of the members of the steering committee for this conference. I'm also a design researcher, um, and my, my paid work is design research, and in my uh, limited spare time and energy, I like to try and apply my design and research to trying to figure out ways to create better tools essentially for, for chronically pain people to care for ourselves and each other. Um, because, so, so to share a little bit of background about myself, I have chronic pain. I've had chronic pain since I was about four years old. I was not accurately diagnosed um, until I was uh, 30 years old. So that was, that was 26 years. And so I have minimal faith in our healthcare system as it currently exists to serve the needs of what I call invisibilized disabled people, people who the clinical gaze um, is, tends to be unwilling or unlikely to recognize. Um, and I think a lot of us are familiar with the experience of having our pain sort of doubted, disbelieved, chalked up to being psychosomatic or you know, behavioral, we're not eating right, we're not exercising enough, et cetera, et cetera. And so to me, while recognizing that we should not have to be in charge of our own care and we should not be having to advocate this hard for our own care, it is also important to create the tools for people to survive under this system. And so I, I, I called this presentation initially describing your pain to clinicians um, and actually, sorry, I've now, minimize Zoom without sharing my screen. So we're just gonna take a brief pause and try that again. Uh, share screen, describing the pain to clinicians and present. And present review. There we go. All right, so I initially called this presentation describing your pain to clinicians. And as I was putting the pieces of it together, I realized that it's actually equally, if not more so about learning how to recognize and interpret your own pain. Because I think a lot of us learn to tune out our pain, especially if like me, we've gone years without an accurate diagnosis. And especially if during those years, we've been told over and over that we're imagining or we're exaggerating or we're simply focusing too much on our pain. And so relearning how to recognize, how to distinguish and how to describe your pain for yourself is an important first step in being able to communicate it to others. And there, there are, I, I would say there are two components or, or two reasons for learning how to describe our pain effectively. And one of those is for ourselves. And so when I, when I sort of about 23, 24 years into my undiagnosed uh, journey was when I, I sort of finally realized again that I was in chronic pain. So when I was about four years old, I remember complaining 
to my doctors and to my parents that it would feel like my knee would get stuck in the wrong spot. Um, I actually learned left from right because my left knee was the one that always seemed to get stuck and seemed to hurt all the time. And then when I was about eight, I sort of got more specific with my language and I told my parents and my doctors that it felt like my kneecap was popping out of place. And when I was 30, I was finally diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that causes your joints to spontaneously dislocate. So for 30 years, my joints were spontaneously dislocating and I was describing it pretty accurately at the age of eight. Um, and it still took another 22 years after that for it to actually be recognized. And that was because in part, when I described that pain to my doctors, they never even considered Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as a possibility. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as a possibility was never considered until I specifically asked for it, asked for an evaluation for that. So for me, <clears throat> learning to recognize the pain that I was experiencing as dislocations and subluxations was the necessary step to getting to ask the question that got me to a point of getting diagnosed and getting the knowledge to understand what was happening in my body and to then care for it, to work with it rather than constantly working against it. And this is, you know, I think we tend to think of diagnoses as things that are handed down to us by doctors. And as a result too, there's, you know, people feel a lot of different ways about a diagnosis. Sometimes it feels, you know, like, like a curse that you're being handed, or some people feel like pursuing a diagnosis is sort of futile because you're pursuing the approval of the clinic and you know you should you should focus on social issues i'm sort of talking again about the i, I would say non chronically ill disabled perspective there but for me a diagnosis could mean something different i'm thinking diagnosis in a very broad way not sort of specific to what happens in the clinic but diagnosis as a way of identifying and thinking through how things work and pain is one of the ways that our bodies communicates with us. So learning to recognize and interpret that pain is like learning to speak the language of our bodies. And to me, I think that's the promise of what diagnosis could and should be. And then at the same time, talking to others about pain, um, it, it's important because it, for others who have access, who have potentially greater access to the knowledge about how bodies work on a physiological on a cellular level, in the ideal interaction, learning how to describe pain in a way that can be understood by them and can be translated into that framework can be really useful. And so to think about describing pain to clinicians, I think it's useful to start thinking about um, how the modern clinic works and how the modern clinic sort of started looking at bodies about 250 years ago. And so in the 18th and 19th century, sort of what we would call modern Western science was starting and influenced by natural scientists who described and mapped the elements of the outside world, trying to discover the relationships between them and the rules that governed how they behaved. Early pathologists thought, oh, we could maybe do the same thing with the body. They, they wanted to look inside bodies and describe and map the pieces of them and how they were related to each other. And it was really through their work that sickness came to be understood as something that has a specific, concrete, tangible, observable location in the body. And that was where we sort of really started to have the idea of actually looking at and looking into bodies in order to find the reality of sickness. Because before that, it was really about talking to sick people and, you know, discerning what was happening within their, their body and soul holistically. And obviously, <laughs> the level of medical knowledge that we had in the 16th and 17th centuries was limited in many ways, but I think there was actually something really, really important about that approach, that approach of sort of learning through talking and, and analyzing the words that people were using to describe their own experiences of their body. Because I think so, that's something that's really been lost, particularly with regard to things like the nervous system and the immune system, because they've the thing about the pathological gaze, that gaze that tries to look into bodies to find out what is wrong with them, it depends on things that can be sort of frozen in time. It depends on things that we can cut out using biopsies, things that we can you know, extract and put on a slide and look at through a microscope, things that we can capture on a CT scan or an MRI if you're lucky enough to even be able to convince your doctor to refer you for one. But the nervous system has always 
sorry, I keep trying to scroll on my notes and switching slides instead. Uh, the nervous system has always posed a challenge to this way of looking at the body because the way that it works depends not just on how it's structured. Its structure is so complicated and so minute. And the way it works is also dynamic, determined by these really dynamic, really fast interactions between incredibly volatile molecules. I mean, the way that a nerve transmits an impulse, it's, it's about electricity traveling along a series of cells. I mean, how, how do you freeze that in order to observe it, right? Unless there's something structurally happening with the cell, you, that's just inaccessible to the way that medicine, modern medicine looks at the bodies. And at the same time, the separation of body and mind of subject of, of, you know, of the subjective and the objective ways of thinking about the world. N neurology, the nervous system poses a challenge to that because you, know, you can look at it as an object, as an outside observer, and yet it is also where thinking and feeling happen. And so it's, it's sort of treated as this paradox. And even if you read about the ways that sort of philosophers of medicine and psychiatrists write about pain, it is this very almost mystical way of describing it. It's, it's this sort of opaque mystery to them. And so I think, you know, this idea of translating the experience of the body into the physical reality is something that, that really falls apart when we get to pain. And I don't think that's the fault of pain or the fault of this the sick person or the pained person who's describing their pain, I think it's the fault of the framework and the way that the framework has sort of failed to acknowledge its own limitations. So, you know, we, we have pain scales. That's where I think most of us are probably fairly familiar with it. And each of them tries to do a fairly specific thing and each of them is sort of limited in different ways. So there's the numeric rating scale, which is the one that we all, you know, know and love. Um, What's interesting too, is that it actually is meant to ask about how pain affects you rather than how it quote unquote feels, which is a problem in a lot of different ways because A, I actually don't think most people realize that. I don't, I don't, it's never mentioned when it's actually posed to you when they actually ask you to rate your pain on the scale of one to 10. Um, to be honest, I didn't realize it until a little while ago. I always thought I was being clever by uh, framing it in terms of my activities of daily living when I was actually just doing what I was apparently supposed to in the first place. But also those of us with chronic pain know that pain affects you very differently because when you, you've adapted to it over the course of years or decades, you know, you, you can do a lot of things with moderate or severe pain. Like I, I can have a pain, a, a migraine that I would rate at an eight or a nine and, you know, I can still, I can't do cognitively intensive work, but I can, I can certainly do basic activities of daily living, which are things like feeding yourself, things like showering. Uh, you know, I can, I can post on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I, I can rant on Twitter. Um, there are like, you, you adapt to it. It becomes a lot less intense. And, and I mean, even to the point that you, you stop noticing certain types of pain too. I introduced this by talking about how you unlearn your pain. And when I was in my mid twenties, I had an experience where I was sitting on the couch with a friend and I kept shifting around and feeling really embarrassed because I thought that I must be bothering him. We were trying to watch a movie. And then about a few months later, I was reading someone posting about fibromyalgia in a Facebook group that I was in for people with narcolepsy. And they talked about how their allodynia, which is a characteristic pain that you have in fibromyalgia, which is, is pain that happens on your skin. It's a neuropathic pain that happens on your skin uh, with sustained pressure. They start talking about this sort of burning feeling. And all of a sudden I realized that the reason I'm constantly shifting when I sit in one spot is because whatever makes contact with sort of a somewhat hard surface, in my case, it was the arm of the couch that evening, um, causes that burning pain. And all of a sudden, I realized I had chronic pain. It was literally, it was like a, a light bulb moment. I had never, for about 15 years there, I had sort of forgotten or unlearned or unrealized that I had chronic pain. And then it was a light bulb moment. And then from then on, once I sort of accepted or realized that, oh yes, my experiences count as pain, I started learning how to recognize and tell them apart. And so all of this is to say, when you go through that experience of, adapting to pain over the course of years or decades of being untreated and undiagnosed, 
the way that it affects what you can do changes very much. And I mean, that's not to say that it's not disabling too. I, I lost the ability to work. I lost the ability to live independently because what had happened over the years too was that my pain stopped showing up as pain and it started instead showing up as uncontrollable sleepiness. And when I say sleepiness, sleepiness is far too cute a word for what happens in narcolepsy. It is more like an existential pain that feels like your molecules are being ripped apart at the seams and just being conscious is torture. Like it was, it's worse than any pain that I've ever experienced from, you know, unanesthetized bone marrow biopsies to gastric bleeds to the worst migraines that the non-painful pain of narcolepsy was so, so much worse. Um, and that was because that was what my body had find. My body was screaming at me, trying to get me to notice what was happening. <laughs> So anyway, limitations with the numeric uh, pain scale. There is the faces pain scale, which is developed, is, was developed for use with children and is primarily intended for use um, with children and also with other people who may struggle with a numeric scale for whatever reason, if they struggle with counting, if they have other um, you know, cognitive difficulties that, that cause a numeric pain scale to be challenging for them, which I would say is like a lot of neurodivergent people. I don't know any neurodivergent person or really anyone with chronic pain that likes the numeric scale. So, but I think the face's pain scale is also significant because I think it has contributed to stereotypes about how pain is supposed to look among clinicians because how many of us have also had the experience of reporting that we're in seven or eight or nine or 10 pain, but we're not crying because again, we're adapted to it. And also we're many of us are concerned about appearing hysterical if we show too much emotion when we go to the doctor. So this sort of iconography of pain that, that has taken hold in the clinic really shapes the way that clinicians think pain is supposed to look, which often doesn't actually apply to chronic pain at all. Sorry, that was a duplicate scale, uh, slide. So there's the McGill pain questionnaire, which was developed in the 1970s at McGill University um, in Montreal. And it is, it's probably the best one that we have. And it's also probably not used very widely outside of pain clinics. It's more detailed and nuanced. It asks about both the quality and the intensity of pain, which is important because it tries to distinguish different types of pain. And it, it sort of recognizes that different types of pain will inherently feel more or less intense. Um, and it was developed through research on how patients at a particular pain clinic describe their own pain to the doctors. And at the same time, I, I would argue that it still has fairly limited usefulness in supporting people to recognize and interpret their own pain. There are, are a fair few reasons for that. First of all, it was designed for doctors to interpret patients' pain, and it was never really intended as a diagnostic tool. It has since been researched as a diagnostic tool, but the way it was originally designed was they were still interested in standardizing a way to determine how bad pain was. The sort of insight of the doctor who came up with this, uh, Ronald Melzack, was that pain had to have more than one dimension in intensity, as well as various, you know, what he called quality, various dimensions of, of quality. But all of this was still, the goal was still to find out how severe pain was, not necessarily what kind of pain it was. And so that, that shaped the way they organized it. It shaped the questions that they asked about the descriptions that patients gave them. And I think it's also important to look at, you know, their language there, like grueling, cruel, vicious, wretched, blinding, troublesome. I don't actually know any chronically pained people who talk about their pain that way to themselves or to each other. That is language that patients use specifically when trying to persuade a doctor to care about them. And I mean, that is, that is not to place any blame on the patients themselves for using that language because this is, these are the survival strategies that we have to use in order to persuade doctors to provide the care that we need. But I think as a starting point for figuring out like what do, what do these different types of pain really feel like and finding ways to identify them based on how they feel, I think it has limited usability for that. And specifically too, when it comes to someone who is themselves chronically pained, trying to figure out the source of their pain, trying to determine strategies for identifying where the pain is coming from, 
we need the language that patients themselves use to describe it. We don't need the language that patients use to describe it to clinicians because it's about how patients think of it for themselves. And so that's sort of my starting point for how we might try and, and solve this communication problem. This is sort of, okay, I've, I've talked through a lot of this already, but essentially what happens is we have clinical biases that happen in terms of how doctors interpret the words that we use to describe our pain. And so we, we choose our words in order to try and navigate around those biases, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And often we still end up on a long journey of misdiagnosis before we get to the quote unquote right answer if we ever do. And of course, then what can happen all along the way is that we learn to stop recognizing our pain or we learn to start interpreting our pain in the ways that the clinic has given in, us information about. So th this is also, also often used as, as sort of a, a reason why patients self-reporting of pain is untrustworthy. Clinicians say, some, some clinicians say that, well, the clinic gives patients language about what kind of pain is legitimate. And so then, you know, you see a lot of patients start to use the same kind of language, but the reason is because that is, it's not that the patients are malingering about their pain or that they're, they're turning their emotions into pain and, and the clinic has given them language to sort of somatic, somaticize, turn their emotions into a physical sensation. That's the accusation that's sort of leveled against uh, this phenomenon. But I know from experience that what's actually happening is you have the pain and you're grasping for ways to understand it, ways to identify what's happening in your own body. And the only information that you have to pull from to try and understand what's happening in your own body is the language that's been given to you by the clinic. So when I was six through about like 10 years old, I kept asking, are we sure that I don't have arthritis in my knees? Because arthritis was the one kind of pain I knew happened in your bones. Turned out like 24 years later, I did indeed have pain in my bones, but it was a very different kind of pain. It wasn't inflammatory pain in my bones. It was mechanical pain from my bones literally pressing on each other and then causing everything around the area to seize up. So I was actually, I was doing a pretty good job of identifying where things were happening and like, like what was wrong, but I didn't have the vocabulary or the knowledge about the range of things that could go wrong in that particular part of my body to sort of say, hey, should we maybe be looking at connective tissue disorders rather than arthritis? And similarly, when I was 18 or 19, I started having this feeling that I would describe as running a fever, but like in specific parts of my body. And I kept asking about lupus because again, that was, they, they tested me. I was diagnosed with a bleeding disorder when I was about four years old. That was the one thing they diagnosed me with. And everything sort of referred back to that. They kept testing me over and over and over for lupus. Um, that was the one thing they were willing to check for. And it was always negative. But that was sort of, again, that was the language I had learned. That was the thing that I had learned to be on the lookout for. And so I was interpreting the pain, what ended up being neuropathic pain in my feet and flushing from my mast cells. I was interpreting that as the inflammation of systemic lupus. And so it's, you know, the, the language that clinicians give to patients influences the way that they interpret their own pain, but not insofar as that patients are imagining their own pain into being, but rather that they're, they're grasping for frameworks to try and understand it. And, and so we need to provide patients tools that come from, so I'm using the word patients, we need to provide people with pain, tools that come from other people with pain in order to find more effective, more useful language to first of all, identify the sources of their own pain and to identify what's happening with your own body. So this is the challenges of describing pain. It is recognizing pain, telling different kinds of pain apart from one another, then finding sort of the essence of pain. What is the most relevant part of that pain? The thing that makes it distinct from other pains, the thing that allows you to identify it. What are the ways that the clinic might misinterpret that essential description that you come up with? And then what is the language you can actually use to be understood and believed? Those are sort of the challenges that we have yet to address, but that I'm I'm hopefully starting to address with this work. So what I began with was, and I'm just checking the time real quick. We're running, we're running out of time uh, a little. 
check in. Yeah. Um, so I, I did an open-ended survey um, online questionnaire, which asked people very open-ended questions about what kinds of pain do you have? Um, can you think about one of the kinds of pain? How do you describe it? Or how do you think of it to yourself? Does this match the way that you talk about it to your doctor? And then I also posed a question on Twitter as I was going through the results of the open-ended survey and finding that there were, there's a lot of sort of overlapping language that people were using to describe what I would characterize as different types of pains. And it was really hard to pull apart. Um, it was really hard to find distinctive language for each individual type of pain. And so on Twitter, I posed a question to people using um, common chronic illness hashtags. And I said, if you experience multiple different types of chronic pain, for example, neuropathic, muscular, joint pain, how do you tell those types of pain apart, especially if they happen in the same area? And so there are a bunch of limits and benefits to, this met, uh, to these methods. Open-ended questions tend to be hard to interpret, so people may answer in ways that you don't expect, but that can also be really useful because as happened with the initial survey, it can lead you into new directions and, and sort of lead you to questions that you realize you actually do need to be asking because with this type of work, you know, we're dealing with subjective experiences with really unclear language that is shaped not only by the person's experience, but by the clinic, by their, their sort of cultural environment. There is so much uncertainty about even like, what questions do we even need to be asking to get to where we need to be? And so social media online is really, really useful for that, I find, because it is relatively low cost and effort, both for me to set it up and for the people to respond. And so what happens when I realize that I'm asking the wrong questions, I can sort of fairly easily pivot and start asking better questions. And there's also the possibility, especially on Twitter for the conversation to evolve because you know, I would, someone would give me a reply on Twitter and someone else was, would respond with something else talking about the ways in which, oh yes, this is how I think my pain for myself. But actually I found that that raises red flags for doctors because of X, Y, Z. And so because there's a possibility for people to respond to each other, not just you, you actually end up going in some really interesting directions, which again, can be really useful for research that is sort of just starting out, just taking baby steps. So there were some really useful strategies that emerged for how people identify and tell their pain apart. They catalog it. And by that, I mean, sort of what sociologists would call thick description. They look at so many different possible characteristics and they try to be really, really just mindful about, about describing that. And often a lot of people talked about logging them in different ways. Um, one user who, there's gonna be a swear here in the handle, but I wanna, I wanna give them credit. It's fibrofuckboy on Twitter and absolutely incredible suggestion. Um, they draw it on a map of their body, an anatomical map of their body specifically. And so they, they have taken a course, uh, Anatomy for Dancers, which talks about connective tissue. It talks about muscles. And so by then drawing the pain on a specifically anatomical map of the body, that allows them to pinpoint what is this overlapping? What is this wholly contained within? And then to, to find, okay, does this seem like it might be happening in the muscle or in the ligaments or in the tendon or superficially? Uh, people talked about how deep does it feel? So something that came up over and over again was, um, was neuropathic pain tends to feel superficial. It feels like it's on the surface. Muscle pain feels deeper, but not as deep as joint pain, which is unsurprising, or deep as organ pain, which was something that not a lot of people talked about, but is a whole other uh, difficult ball game. Um, what shape does it have? So people talked about things that fe felt blunt or dull, but also things that felt diffuse versus localized. And, and I, I could easily relate that to my own back pain, which it usually feels like it's radiating out from a central point, which makes sense because generally for me, my muscle pain comes from a muscle that is uh, spasming and, and forms into a knot. And so what happens with my muscular pain is that there is the central pain at the knot. And then it also sort of impinges on the nerves around it, uh, on the connective tissue, inflammation comes to the area, which tends to be diffuse. And there is something to this too, which is that learning anatomy can be really useful for sort of giving yourself a framework for what is possible within your body. And 
Yeah, I think like for, for me, it's beneficial. Um, I, I have a background in biology, which has been really beneficial because again, it provides me like that anatomy for dancers course, anatomy for artists textbooks can be really useful because it just, it provides you a, a reference point in, in the same way that medicine tries to look inside the body it provides you kind of a way of doing that, but in a more dynamic way. It provides you a reference point for what generally is in there and what are the possibilities of what is going on. Um, people also talk about, does it stay the same or does it change? And that doesn't just mean, you know, does it stay for five or 10 minutes? Does it go away? But also like, is it is it a steady ache or is it throbbing? Is it pulsating? Is it radiating out from one spot? Obviously, how did it start is a really useful one for if you're someone who experiences subluxations or dislocations, even if you don't realize that you do, if it's something that happens when you're getting up from a chair, for example, that implies something mechanical or traumatic that's happening rather than something inflammatory. So if there is sort of a specific starting point, you can identify a sudden one that indicates something that's, that's more mechanical in nature. People also talked a lot about experimenting with it. So do you feel it more or less with certain movements, certain positions? Again, um, subluxations and dislocations, they will often feel better or worse if you move in certain ways. Similarly, allodynia, that pain that comes with pressure, that will be relieved pretty much as soon as you move the pressure away. Um, do you feel anything under your skin when you press on it? So often people who experience muscular pain and muscle spasms uh, and inflammatory muscle pain, they'll have what are called trigger points, which are both very tender. Um, so if you sort of find like an epicenter of the pain and you press on it and it feels almost like pressing on a deep bruise, that can be a trigger point. And trigger points can also feel like nodules. They're literally what we call muscle knots. Oh, that's nice. I found a trigger point right there. Lovely. Um, so they're they, they can feel also like hard nodules under your skin and they can actually become harder as you press on them because what happens is that's the muscle reacting to you pressing and, and spasming more. And then if you continue pressing on it for a few minutes, then often you'll feel a pop and it releases. And that's actually the muscle fiber um, loosening up again, relaxing. And then there's just spending time with it. Like it is fundamentally a skill to be able to recognize and name your own pain. So practice what I call invalid mindfulness. And I call it invalid mindfulness specifically to distinguish it from the way that people with chronic pain are often told to practice mindfulness, which is a way of accepting your pain. Um, and that I don't want to dismiss the utility of that for some people, but I think it's also useful to acknowledge that some of us just want to improve our pain and, and learning to sit with it and think about it and, and really focus on it can actually be a way to do that because it can provide you with the insights you need to figure out what is happening and how you can work with it. Like this is language that I use a lot because for years I felt like I was fighting against my body and it felt so revolutionary to me to realize that by figuring out what was happening inside my body, I wasn't just giving in to the way the clinic sees me as a sick person. I was using the tools of the clinic for my own purpose to try and figure out how I could understand what my body was asking from me and treat it better and work with it rather than constantly being in battle against it. Um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of people talked about giving it a name, which they, they felt that giving it a name sort of gave it a, a distinct personality. A lot of people talked about how they know the pain, but it's hard to put it into words and giving it a name seemed to be a way of capturing that complexity without having to concern yourself too much about the specifics. Once, once you recognize a personality and give a name to it, then you can recognize it the next time it comes around without having to worry about, okay, yes, it is this deep, it's this blunt, it's, it's stinging, it's electric, it's sharp, whatever. It's just that one person called it Sylvia after a particularly ableist relative. <laughs> so that's just Sylvia showing up again. Um, another suggestion that I loved was writing poetry about it. A lot of people talked about the metaphors and the figurative language they used. And, and some of the responses that I got were incredibly beautiful. And again, there is something about that figurative language that allows you to sort of really capture and, and just be with the, the peculiarities and sort of the oxymoronic, the self-contradictory nature that, that pain often feels like. There were, so my back pain, I've always sort of, described it as burning, but I've also had trouble with that because it's not the same kind of burning as the neuropathic pain that I get in my feet. And I was like, 
I've always sort of said it feels more like a rug burn, whereas the burning pain in my feet feels like putting my feet on a space heater for way too long. And then someone in my Twitter replies just talked about their own muscular pain and talked about it as icy hot. And I was like, oh my God, that is it. It's what it feels like putting icy hot, but like on a cut or something. It's icy hot, but incredibly intense. Icy hot being the camphor or menthol cream in case you're not familiar with the brand name, but like immediately it's like, oh, that is the exact sensation. So how, using that figurative and metaphoric language that poetry does so well can be a really useful tool for capturing those specifics. And then when you share it with others or when you analyze the language that you're using to figure out like, what is it? Why does this language feel so appropriate? Then you can start to again, trace it back to, okay, so like, what is the language that feels right? What is that maybe telling me about the physical aspects of this pain? Or you can compare it with the language that other people are using and find points of commonality and be like, oh yes, that's what I'm experiencing. So this is far from complete. There is, I, so full disclosure, my analysis is only about half finished because long COVID just took me out. I, I don't think I mentioned that at the start of this presentation. I got COVID six weeks ago, literally four hours after uh, posting the initial survey to Twitter. Um, so that sort of has taken me out more than I was hoping. Um, so this is incredibly um, preliminary results, but some of the commonalities that showed up for nerve pain were sharp, electric, tingling. Um, temperature was one, and most people talked about hot and burning, but some people also talked about cold. And so just the fact that there is a temperature component to it um, seemed really significant. The one that I really loved that people brought up was that it's hard to ignore um, versus particularly people talked about muscle spasm, which at least up until a point is easier to ignore. And it's funny because I've, I've been aware of this for a long time, but I've never thought about it as a distinguishing feature of my own pain. I've always just felt like a wimp for the fact that I need to take codeine when my neuropathic pain in my feet is acting up. Cause like, it's your, it's your feet, you're lying down, like who cares, but it's just, I can't tune it out. Whereas my back can be so knotted that even, even doctors will touch my back and be like, wow, that's a mess. And I won't really notice it until you start pressing on the exact trigger points. And so that was really interesting to me that that is such a common experience and that that actually is a distinguishing feature. And it's interesting too, because if you go back to the McGill pain questionnaire, they talk about things like severity. And I actually think what's more important is talking about hard versus easy to ignore because the implications for treatment, it's, it's a little bit more specific and accurate to how we actually think about our pain. Um, and it also gets at the implications for treatment because hard to ignore means like, yeah, you do actually need management even if objectively, physically speaking, there's nothing wrong. Um, and at the same time, muscular pain, that means that there could be something going very wrong on a sort of physiological level and the person may be underreporting it. So on, on both ends, that carries important implications for how we approach and treat these different kinds of pain. And so then getting into talking about this with your clinicians, I, I actually came to the conclusion as I was writing this that none of this is gonna be particularly useful at this point for talking to clinicians because the clinic is not really designed to, to make diagnoses based on the qualities of pain. Like we're not at that point yet. I think we could be, and we should be, and I think that's something we should be working towards. But the fact is that when you are trying to seek answers about pain or treatment for pain to clinicians, what you actually need to be focusing on are the quote unquote objective things, because that is what, that is what registers with the clinician, like not not to lay blame, even though I, I am very happy to lay a lot of blame within the system of the individual practitioners, but not to lay blame for the moment, the system literally just doesn't register what you're saying when you talk about the qualities of pain. Like you can be describing it in great detail and then they're like, okay, so when did it start? And you'll be like, well, I'm not sure. And it's just, you know, so keeping a diary of these pain types of pain to identify them yourself, I think is a really useful starting point. And then once you have a general ballpark idea, you need to start thinking about, okay, what are the ways that these are normally talked about in literature like Healthline in, you know, the website for the Mayo Clinic. And often they will talk about 
trigger events. Um, again, things that worsen it, things that make it better. Um, I think talking about specifically what you've tried, um, what has worked partially, um, why it hasn't been enough, and what hasn't worked at all, I think is all really important. And I think focusing on those very objective things, that is the survival strategy to use at the time being, while at the same time trying to work towards ways of recognizing pain that are more about using sort of this inductive reasoning that starts from a point of view of what is the patient experiencing in their body and trying to translate it without sort of resorting to this idea that we need to see it in order to believe it. And I should have one more slide, which is just not showing up for me, but I'm going to say I want to also, I, this, is, this is a presentation for chronically pain people, but in the event that there are doctors or researchers or policymakers in the audience, I want to say that this is also not all on us. You know, these, I, I'm talking about survival strategies for people in pain, but the people who are actually enmeshed in the system need to be working towards changing the system. And part of that is learning anti-oppression strategies, learning about the ways that racism, misogyny, cis sexism, fat antagonism, ableism, influence the way that you perceive patients, the way that your colleagues perceive patients when they're talking about their pain to you and then working against it, actively working against it. Because the fundamental thing is that generally speaking, you are the one with the power in the clinical interaction. Um, you know, acknowledging that, that practitioners who are themselves marginalized can experience abuse along axes of marginalization and oppression from, from patients. But within the clinical relationship, it is the clinician who has the power. And so therefore it is your responsibility to change these unjust dynamics that happen within the system. And just saying, I get that it sucks, but that's the system that is not enough. That's not doing anything to fix the system. That's just absolving yourself of your responsibility to fix it. So I would also say learning qualitative research skills is important. All of what I'm talking about here, all of what I'm talking about in terms of trying to get from a patient's description of their symptoms to a physio to translating that into a physiological framework that is fundamentally doing semi-structured interviewing and then thematic coding that is what qualitative researchers do so honing your qualitative research skills learning them taking courses reading books there are really great books on semi-structured interviewing and thematic coding and all kinds of different techniques for coding qualitative data that could actually help you to develop your clinical practice and do a better job of diagnosing patients. Um, and then also fundamentally, just if you're someone who has research funding, who, who applies for research funding and has the institutional capacity to be able to apply for research funding, start putting people with lived expertise onto your grant applications as co-investigators. Because the thing is there are so many people with lived expertise, lived experience, who have so much knowledge and literally just they, they can't get it funded. <laughs> you know, people, disabled people, chronically pain people disproportionately live in poverty. Uh, we have less time and energy uh, in our days. So we can't sort of, it, it is very difficult. And I say this as someone who tries to hold down a day job and also do research on the side, my research progresses very, very slowly and frustratingly because I don't have that much time. And without funding to, dedicate some of my my daytime hours to it you know that that contributes to that so start naming chronically pain disabled multiply marginalized people as co-investigators not only so that they have access to funding but so that they have access to agency within the research process so that they are setting agendas and designing research plans and not just contributing as users providing feedback so that is me i think Oh, I'm eight seconds over. Not too bad. All right. So if we have any questions, um, yeah, I will, I will throw it back to Therese. Yes. Thank you, Alex. We do have some questions. Okay. Um, this one comes from Chris J. Um, the, it starts out saying, I read an article in a psychology journal a couple of years ago about a study on the use of pain language amongst chronic pain sufferers. And their astounding conclusion was that the use of more and more vivid words to describe pain is an indicator of the pain being psychological rather than biological. 
all in their heads. As a pain patient trying to make sense of the pain and be as articulate as possible, that conclusion robs me of all my ability and right to be verbal about pain because it biases clinicians against me. What options are left, are left for us if they refuse to listen? Uh, it is a good and terrible and frustrating question. And for me, I, I look at it with rage and also practicality, which is that at a certain point, you have to make a choice between what will maybe afford you survival within a terrible, terrible, unjust system and what feels right to you. And I say this as someone, I um, I declined a referral that I've been waiting for a year and a half for to the pain clinic in my city because they require urine tests. Um, and I just had a friend um, who had died of medical neglect. The, the official records will say she ended her life. She died of medical neglect because of her chronic pain. And I could not stomach being asked to give a urine sample as the first interaction with that clinic because it sets the entire dynamic of the clinical relationship out on a basis of mistrust, on a basis of the idea that my own account of my pain and of the ways that I manage it in my day-to-day -day life are fundamentally untrustworthy. So I tend to be the kind of sick person who tilts at windmills and just withdraws myself from the system entirely um, and, and will cut off my nose to spite my face. Although I, I don't actually think I'm doing that. For me, it was a matter of making a choice between what might get me access to something that might help manage my pain slightly. I was hoping for trigger point injections and what would protect my mental health more at the time. Um, but at a certain point too, sometimes it, it becomes about strategy and about using the language um, that will get you the care you need in the moment if you need it. And I think at the same time, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if you were present for the panel, but this to me is why pain is a political identity, chronic pain is a political identity is so important because I think it is through sharing these experiences and through coming together and through doing advocacy and organizing and finding ways to exert pressure on the system to make, you know, I think I don't wanna speak too ill of our sponsors, uh, but I think it was significant that Minister Bennett talked about how people's friends and family don't believe them. And for me, yes, for my friends and family have not believed me, uh, but the ways in which my doctors have not believed me, the ways in which um, I've had to jump through hoops in order to qualify for ODSP in order to be able to barely survive, that's materially affected my life so much more profoundly the way, than the ways in which my friends and family have not believed me. So I think that coming together and organizing as patients, as, as sick people, sorry, I keep using the word patients and I actually hate that word, as, as chronically ill people, as disabled people, as sick people, um, I think to me that's essential. And I, I think finding that community and finding that solidarity in these experiences of, of rage and frustration is equally important to our survival. I, I don't know if that's a useful answer, but yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay, there's um, another question here from Connie Porter. Is there a way to get a copy of this particular slide types and characteristics, then we can use them better with our physicians? Yes. So my my plan, I, I want to cite the people who I've drawn from on Twitter um, in this slideshow before I put them up. But my hope is that I can share it. I'm happy to throw it up on Feedloop if I can figure out how. Um, but also my hope is to share it with Pain Canada and maybe develop something that can live a little bit more permanently um, somewhere on the website. And hopefully also keep developing it into something a little bit more comprehensive and useful but slowly because I move slowly. <laughs> and uh, Drew just wanted to say that was very excited when you cited the tweet. Hey, <laughs> I loved your strategy. It was amazing. <laughs> we have another question. Um, this is from Natasha Lawton. How do we convey to doctors that pain has gotten worse? Oh dear. It feels like once a doctor has treated your pain, you're kind of out of their consciousness. 
like I can't even get my clinic to respond to my calls because I've already seen their pain specialist. And that was several years ago. And I have new and worse pain now. Oh, this is <sighs> favorite for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, that is, uh, these are all such good questions and none of them have good answers. And I feel so horrible and I can't provide useful advice other than to just acknowledge how real a struggle this is. Um, I would say on the sort of immediate survival level, if you have a family doctor, you can trust. And I think that's a big if. I think sort of getting them to be in solidarity with you is incredibly useful. They can be, they act as gatekeepers, but if you can, if you can build a relationship of even semi-trust with, with your family doctor, they can also be your best resource in accessing care. Whether that is sending a letter, a nudge, a fax, phoning the clinic, um, a referral to another pain clinic, which is a horrific prospect because that obviously is another couple years, if not more, of waiting. If you have other, actually, so this is, if you have other specialists that you do get along with, I have, I have two doctors that I actually get along with quite well, and they have advocated to me, they have advocated for me two doctors in ways that are outside of the scope of their treatment of me. So I have a sleep doctor who once advocated to my immunologist because my immunologist wanted to do a test without providing me adequate sedation. <laughs> um, I, they, they wanted to repeat a test that I had been traumatized by as a five-year-old, the bone marrow biopsy without anesthetic. They wanted to do it without uh, giving me twilight sedation. They wanted to only give me a Xanax and wouldn't believe me that a single Xanax would not do anything for me. And so I initially spoke to my, my sleep doctor saying, um, can you just like tell them that Xanax doesn't always work for people with narcolepsy? Like we have weird reactions to medications. And then I told him a little bit more about the experience and he was appalled as someone who had also been traumatized by a medical procedure and was very aware of the need for sedation when having repeat traumatic procedures. Um, and he ended up writing a letter to the immunologist about it. Similarly, I am... Um, on uh, testosterone um, for gender health stuff. And the gender health clinic in this city is just appalling and, and basically um, just kept delaying um, my access to testosterone for more than a year um, without providing any medically reasonable uh, explanations for it. And the endocrinologist that they ended up referring me to, on the other hand, is really good. And I've phoned his clinic on a couple occasions to intercede. So, so one time, sim what reminded me of this was the gender clinic essentially ghosted me. Um, and, and after a certain point, just wasn't getting back to me, even though I'd by that point jumped through all of the hoops that they told me I needed to in order for them to deem testosterone as a valid uh, choice for me and you know, with my chronic illness. Um, and so at that point I phoned the endocrinologist clinic and begged for help and they, Three days later, I had my testosterone. Um, so sometimes if you can find another clinician who can intercede with you, even if it's not technically within the realm of, of their practice and care of you, that can be incredibly useful. And it's, it's rare, like it is, I've seen a lot more than two doctors in my life and, and two is how many I've had actually sort of step outside of the, the rigid limits of what they need to be doing for me. Um, but if you can, it can be incredibly, incredibly useful. And then again, on a more tilting at windmills note, connecting, like connecting with organiz organizations like Pain Canada and also with disability organizations and pushing for chronic pain representation and for disability justice oriented representation within pain organizations. And again, trying to push for some of these more radical systemic changes, ways of recognizing the systemic problems at the root of this. That is not about individual practitioners. It's about the way, it's not even about Canada. There are aspects that are about Canada, but it is about the way that pain is treated by the modern clinic within the whole world. And it has to do with how disabled people are viewed within economies that prioritize, that place value on people, depending on the ways in which they're able to work or not. And so being able to sort of push for recognition of these systemic problems is, it may not bring immediate relief, but it, it brings some spiritual relief to me, at least the rage, the rage fuels me at this point. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really 
uh, Hudson. She says, it's not really a question. All of these challenges are totally compounded when you don't have a family doctor. There is such stigma and basically disinterest from walk-in doctors who don't know me. I stop by saying I'm not a hypochondriac. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've experienced that. I've had to say that. I'm sure you have too, Alex. And, yeah. And especially, mm -hmm. I mean, especially if you rely on any kind of medication that's mm -hmm. restricted or, or even stigmatized, it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I moved 300 kilometers away from my family doctor. I am unbelievably lucky that she was willing to keep me on her patient list. I can't see her in person, but she was willing to keep me on her patient list and keep doing my prescriptions. Cause like I, I have stimulants for my narcolepsy. I would just, I would not be able to get them. It's absurd. I, I have a question. If you're new to your pain and to working with healthcare providers to figure it out, how do you even know how they put about their potential biases and how their language about your pain even will impact you? Oh, so this is this is a self-harming recommendation. I can't I can't in good conscience recommend that you read this book because it's like the worst book I've ever read, but it was also unbelievably useful. It is I was trying to remember my name is by Edward Shorter, who is a psychiatrist and the chair of history of medicine at the University of Toronto. But it is written for a sort of fairly general audience. It's not packed with academic language. It is from, from, from paralysis to fatigue, a history of psychosomatic illness. And I think you can sort of glean from that title what his angle is. But oh my God, it does it ever provide insight into the, the ways that clinicians think about pain and why that has come about. It requires reading between the lines because the narrative that he's selling in that book is horrendously ableist. But if you read between the lines, it provides insight as to why clinicians think the way they do about chronic pain, um, which to me is incredibly valuable, but like, I don't know, you may want, some chamomile tea or stronger substances uh, to accompany you as you read that. <laughs> or I don't know, like ranting on Twitter. I was live tweeting it as I was reading it and it was satisfying um, if still incredibly stressful. <laughs> um, my uh, video has been stopped because um, uh, my audio was not great, but um, we're just about at time, uh, Alex. I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd like to say on this. Um, I'm good. I noticed that someone uh, asked about something called Change Pain Clinic, which I have not, but I'm going to look yeah. up because I'm I'm intrigued. But yeah, I think I've covered more or less everything that I'd hope to. And thank you all for your amazing, if hard to answer, questions. <laughs> <laughs> Lots, lots of claps and hearts here. <laughs> okay, and, and so yeah, sorry. It, sorry, uh, just read the slides. I will um, see about throwing them up on feed loop this evening or tomorrow, and then hopefully it'll turn into something uh, that will live on the, the website as well. Thank you. That was a great session. It um, certainly got people talking, that's for sure. And that's so <laughs> one of our main intentions right so, <laughs> thank so, you so um, much for fielding the questions yeah. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thanks to all those who have participated as speakers and as attendees in today's sessions we hope you enjoyed the sessions the gentle movement and the water cooler breaks we hope that you'll join us tomorrow for sessions start at 2 p.m eastern and run till 5 p.m. Eastern. The format will be similar with two hours of programming and one hour of break, gentle movement, water cooler in between. And, uh, I did mention earlier that I am speaking tomorrow uh, along with um, um, Lise de Sao, who is um, a researcher and um, we're going to be talking about chronic pain and equity, which is one equity is one of my favorite subjects. So I hope to see everybody tomorrow.
I hope you enjoyed today's session. I know I did. So have a great evening, day, whatever time zone you're in. Bye now. <laughs>